Welcome to another episode of Life After with Tykira Carter. This is my first time doing my podcast video live, and I have two wonderful ladies here with me. We have Ari Chambers, sports journalist. You guys probably seen her a little bit of everywhere from the WNBA to the NCAA on the women's side. She's done it all. And then we have Isis Young. She's a student athlete and also a sports journalist who will be joining us today. And we're going to be speaking about social injustice, police brutality, and how all these things can ultimately affect or may not affect college athletics. So how are you guys today? Girl, just trying to stay above water. You know, we've been, well, we've been dealing with these injustices for a lifetime, but they've been really brought to light now. It only took a global pandemic and no sports to do it, but I'm just glad that now people are starting to see um, that the world needs to change. And it, it's just been very eye opening. I mean, we've always had the social media that, well, not always, but for the past few years, we've had social media. We've, we've protested in, 2011, 2012, 2014, 2016, especially in 2016, that was heavy. But there's something different about 2020. So as far as how I'm doing, I'm just trying to stay ab above water. I'm trying to not um, be buried by the secondhand trauma that I'm feeling. I'm trying not to pain from my brothers and sisters getting senseless, senselessly killed. But I'm just happy to surround myself with you guys that, you know, uh, my sisters, y'all y'all know what we go through and, 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 can talk this out with with people that could understand and people that are willing to listen. Yes, I sis, I definitely agree. You know, I have me and Ari have talked and checked on each other and made sure that we were doing good during this time. Um, I think I'm all about uplift right now. Um, I know that we are struggling. I know that as a country, as a people, as women, as men, like our, our community is just struggling as a whole, um, and. I've just been about uplift. I really have just been giving a lot of information on my page, um, on my social medias, trying to show a lot of love and support, you know, challenging those that are close to me to be their best at this time when our world is at its worst um, is really what my message has been. So it's been tough. I think secondhand trauma is like a great word that you just use when talking about how you're feeling because that's what we're experiencing. Um, but with that, the way that I'm trying to deal with that is just with uplift and leaning on my community, leaning on close friends, family, my church community that I can really trust and talk to and figure out how we can create change in the small world around us. And I love that. I love both of your points because I think people are seeing more and more how, no, we didn't know George Floyd. We don't know him necessarily from a can of paint, but it does affect us. It affects mm -hmm. our communities where women, you know, we don't want to think one day we might have to raise kids in a world like this mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So kind of really focusing on making change in a positive way through our platforms and stuff like that is very important. And which is why it's important to have talks like we're having today. So sort of switching gears, we've been seeing all over social media things like if you're silent, I don't mess with you or in you know the words of Natasha Cloud, if you're silent, I don't fuck with you. Like uh mm -hmm. let's keep it a hundred. And so in that same space, a lot of colleges and universities have spoken out. And then on the other hand, a lot have not. So do we think that our African-American student athletes are paying attention to this? And if so, does this affect recruiting? I think personally, even beyond African-American, I just think that it's really important to, to use the word black in addressing the issues. Um, from especially from bigger companies it's like everybody's been trying to tiptoe around these injustices that we've known that have lasted for so long and you can't you can't do that anymore because right now there's not a two sides situation it's literally like right like you have to be on the right side um because this is a direct reflection of everybody who is black that that plays for you that works for you like companies cannot avoid it because if you are silent at this time you're saying I don't give a fuck about you as a human. These are human rights that, you know, it's like, you know, I'll get to your question, but it's just very interesting to me how we can have pride marches, how we can have women's marches and people won't try to be like, but what about me? But what about me? You know, the importance of having that women's march, you know, the, the way they've been oppressed for some, so long, but when it comes to black, for some reason, the word black really shakes up people. And I don't understand why, one, white people, they retort and they say, 
uh, police kill whites too. Well, isn't that even more reason to join in on on our you know our fight? Um, they 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 say all lives matter. So the only the, or blue lives matter. The only word that you're really missing there is black. You just are so against advocating for blacks, and and that just draws attention to a larger issue. So when you have these schools who are so skeptical about hurting their fan base, it's just like you're playing into that hatred because you're showing that their their privilege and their hatred is 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 more important than our struggles and racial justice human rights this is a human rights issue it just it just is what it is so i'm speaking on behalf of like i used to work for madison square garden i am going on record saying i don't fuck with the response how they've been tiptoeing around things like this like though there are not enough people black working there there are black workers and you know i feel for my teammates who are still there um, who will have to perform on that court every night, whether it be basketball, dance, cheerleading, fan interaction, whatever. You still have to sit there and dance for these people who don't even care about your existence. That to me is messed up. Same way with NCAA. And I, I know ISIS can speak more to this, but uh, you know, I'm thankful because NC State as, as you know, far right as I thought it was, we, I mean, we're, we're the school that's known to raise farmers. Like, you know, as Republican as it can be, they were even able to create a montage uh, about the importance of Black lives and how Black lives matter. Um, the cheerleading squad released the football, basketball, everybody in PAC athletics, NC State as a whole, was able to come together and say Black lives matter. Why is it that these other schools can't get it together and, and speak on behalf of the people they make profits from, the people that they see every day, the people that they might live with, um, work with anything like that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Ty, I think I came in towards the end of your question. Mm -hmm. So you can, I know what Ari was hitting at, but can you just restate that for me? So basically my question was, how does this affect universities who haven't spoken out about these issues? Our student athletes who are about to go to college, are they really paying attention to those who you know, say that they care and stuff like that. And they sit in their, you know, in your living room and they recruit you and they tell you when you get there, like, I'm going to treat you like you're my kid. But when it comes to situations like this, like you can't speak out, will this affect recruiting at all on the college level? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, my answer is yes. I think it has a couple different, different dimensions to it. Um, the first thing is about the student athlete getting recruited by that coach, right? So where does that actual coach on your team stand? How are they having a conversation with your team? What is that atmosphere like? How are they allowing everyone that has different backgrounds, right, be able to come together and feel comfortable in a space to talk about what's going on in the world in an honest way? Like Ari said, it's, this is a human rights issue, right? So even if you didn't come or you're not all Black Lives Matter, this is a human rights issue. Like we all matter as people. Um, and so I, have personally have talked to my coach a ton. She has checked on us a ton. She has made sure that we've been in a space where we could have a conversation where everybody may not have the same political views, but we all still respect each other and respect that outside of this basketball team, I still am Isis Young, a black woman on the street mm -hmm. that could get shot at any time. So mm -hmm. I need y'all to understand that conversation, right, that I could have with them. I, I, so I, I challenge that student athletes really First and foremost, my, my mother has always said, play for a coach that has kids because they mm -hmm. relate to you more, right? If, if a coach is coming to me and saying, well, I don't really have anyone else other than the world besides I have no kids, then, then how can they possibly treat me the same, right? How could mm -hmm. they treat me as if I was their kid if you never experienced that love for your own? Because you mm -hmm. wouldn't send your kid out into the world dangerous and unaware and uneducated. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So don't send me out there like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other fold is with these universities, what I've just seen is the lopsidedness and mm -hmm. diversity in athletic departments, right? Mm -hmm. Someone asked me the other day, you know, have you experienced racism on your team? And, and I said, well, I've been on a couple of different teams, but for the most part, I was at Syracuse with a black head coach with an all black staff with black, you know, uh, helpers that are in the athletic administration. And I said, so that didn't fly. Right. Because I had a black head coach who was making sure that we were all about diversity, that we were getting respected. So to me, I feel like that's where it's staggering right now is that there needs to be a change. We need to hire people that are relatable to those that you have playing on the court, playing on the field, et cetera. Otherwise, I, I really don't see how you could possibly ask them to relate to you and have those conversations. They may have never had them before. And that kind of brings me to 
the other point. I feel like out of all the people out here, and this is just on a sports spectrum, not talking about people out protesting, college athletes have been speaking up so much right now and they have been using their platforms and they've i've seen some out protesting and just you know being all about what's going on um and one tweet that kind of stuck out to me when we speak about uh college basketball and players is chloe jackson she had tweeted at baylor university and coach kim mulkey and was like your silence is really loud. Like, are you going to say something on our behalf? And she went back and she even said, like, I have no issues with coach. Like, we have a great relationship and stuff like that. But it's to raise a point. And that's something that I really enjoyed about her tweet is that, like, she's raising awareness. I've seen other people like Lexi Brown. She's like, college administrators, coaches, athletic mm -hmm. departments, you know, we can't hear you. And so how do you feel about, at this point, student athletes really stepping up to the plate and using their platforms to speak out? It's, it's really brave. Um, I'm, I'm proud of the ones, especially Chloe, because we all know like what Baylor went through. Like Brittany Griner tried to tell us in her book <laughs> back, in, back when she wrote her book. Um, but it was really telling when they still had to go visit Trump. And I know that was against a lot of the team's will. But to be able to speak out to somebody who, uh, you know set up your future is is a big thing um because wrong is wrong in this in this case it's just wrong is wrong and for you to try to pass it off like you do care about everybody and that you know you do care about your players but then again so silent on an issue that's so like prevalent to their lives you can call that bullshit. and i think that's what players are doing they're calling the bluff on these collegiate coaches that are trying to pass off this thing because they have the power, right? They, that, that's that privilege, that's that power. It's like, we have the resources, we have everything set up for you to go to the next level. And that's with inherent like privilege and whiteness because going back to the HBCU debate where everybody is, is trying to pivot to the HBCU, that's gonna take a long time because for so many years, they've been uh, not awarded the same facilities resources, exposure, um, as they're the PWIs of the world. And so it's almost like we're at a weird, weird crossroads that, that the coaches don't necessarily feel like they have to speak on behalf because their program speaks for itself. But I hope this next generation is able to um, put things in perspective for a lot of people and uh, be the sacrificial lamb for for those coming up um because keep it a buck right now hbcus don't have the resources that could um measure up to the pwis but it's going to take several rounds of players to be like i'm going to dedicate my time my life to this um and th those who've already gone through the ncaa process and played their years and have gone on they're able to speak on behalf of that because they're not still entrenched in that system mm -hmm. Yeah, I think being institutionalized right now uh, in college on a team is normally discouraging from players speaking out about anything. I mean, before we talk about, you know, right and wrong and what this is going on, I mean, about, you know, pride, uh, uh, you know, about can they be themselves kind of thing, you know, speaking out about their religion and different things like that, especially depending on what school you go to. Um, I have just been telling everyone as a student athlete, like you have to be able to lay your head on the pillow at night and be okay with how you represented yourself, right? And so if you feel like a coach is not saying anything, not doing anything, not catering to you, what you're going through, creating a space again where you can feel safe and talk, you have to speak up because if you allow it, it's only going to damage the next black guy or black girl that comes after you. You know, it's like anything else. Like Ari said, we kind of got to be the sacrificial lambs right now and really be able to speak out and pave the way. And I think the two players, former, you know, college players that you mentioned, right, Chloe and Lexi, have a status, right? They are set. They have jobs. They're playing basketball players. They have an income. And so no one is going to fire them because they speak out, you know, to their old coach. But I think we have to encourage our student athletes that are still institu institutionalized and on teams to really speak out because if you don't it, it it just hurts the person that comes after you and it's a leverage and the cycle of power, continues right? to go. we've got to start to break some of these cycles and and i think that's why it's so great that student athletes are speaking out right now 
I'm just worried about them because they can it can be used against them. You know, as much as on the forefront on on the social platforms, there's this there's this solidarity in Black Lives Matter. You have no idea what goes on within that program. So it's that fear of being blacklisted, that fear of being blackballed, like um, Cap was. That that fear of uh, even things like playing time being stripped. It's just a scary thing for them, and um, I worry that there are some deep hated, um, deep, well, hate hearted people out there that will um, hold that against their player. So I, I'm, I'm interested to see if these organizations, these teams, these programs can really back them and, and support them like we think or like we're being told. I kind of like my point on that is so we talk about all this stuff now all these kids are away from their campuses, mainly due to COVID-19, but what happens when they do go back to school? Like, do the conversations stop? And that's one of my biggest problems is like, you know, we get riled up about things that go on right now because it's prevalent, but when we get back to that campus, how do you have that uncomfortable conversation with your team? Most teams made up of African-American players. And for the coaches who haven't had to really address situations like this before who can they go to so they can figure out like okay I have to talk to my team about this because I think it's like it's a levels type of thing right like the coaches they never had to address it before and they might need help too so you know who's there to help them when they have to face a team full of black women who don't really understand everybody doesn't have a coach Don Staley who is going to go and speak out for them and who can relate to their struggles and which she said in her article with the Players' Tribune, you know? I think that's why you need more Black coaches. This is exactly why there needs to be more Black coaches. We've been screaming it from the rooftops and hooting and hollering about how Black people need to be in these spaces, especially for relatability, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And people have not heard it. Now you're, now you're scrambling, what should I do, what should I do? You could have just looked to your left if you would have listened before. You could have just looked to your right. And, and it's, not, it's not rocket science. And I don't feel bad for anybody who has to actually do their research on what's going on right now. I, I feel no, because I, I, I don't want to be um, the one giving you all the answers because I think that you should find them on your own. Um, it, it's, it's literally like if you're interested in something, you can move swiftly in, in, in figuring out what you want to do. I, I think along with more Black head coaches because I'm a head coach we have plenty of black assistants like we we can find some if we really want to but we need more head coaches but along with that more athletic directors right we can't you know if, if there's a white coach that doesn't know what to do perfect example at Davidson College that's in the A-10 there is a black athletic director so if one of those coaches have black players a white coach doesn't know how to talk they can go and talk to their AD and say hey you can relate to them maybe you can come and speak to my team on our behalf, just about what's going on. And then I'll take it from the, the team standpoint, right? But if you have no one to look to in the system, in the administration that can reflect what's going on, I, I don't know what to tell you. Besides also to reach out, right? The coaching, the, the National Coaching Association, WBCA on the woman's side, right? They are here for these reasons so that coaches can go. Coaches will talk to other coaches about, hey, what plays are you running? Coach Kelly Carter at Oregon, oh my gosh, how do you get your team to be so efficient? Well, how do we get our team to have conversations about what's going on in the world? So my players feel comfortable. So they don't feel like they're alone. So I also feel like it's reaching out to other coaches. I, I, I highly doubt Dawn Staley would turn someone down if they're saying, hey, I'm trying to talk to my team right now and have a conversation. And to be honest with you, I'm not the one who can relate. I'm not, I'm not the one. Can you help me out? I don't think Dawn would say no. You know, so it's also reaching out and the coaches have to do their work, right? Don't just because you're a coach doesn't mean that you're all educated and you know all things. You've got to do your work as well to then pass that on to your players. So in a sense, it's kind of like it comes back to the conversation that you had with Natasha Cloud. How can I be an ally mm -hmm. in this situation and trying to find the answer in that? So I kind of like the point that you brought up about that. It's all everybody has to work in a sense to make this a collective effort and thing. So we can see ultimate change and reaction. It shouldn't be, yeah, it shouldn't be the weight of us to have to carry, uh, you know, the non-Blacks through this. This isn't my, you know, you, you when you are not informed about something, you research. These, these are issues like, 
seriously, in anything else in life, if you don't know something, you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then it's the motivation to figure it out if it's that urgent to you. Um, Natasha Cloud said, if you don't, uh, if you're not a co-conspirator, then like the allyship's not enough. You have to know that Black Lives Matter. You have to know that we need a racial reformation of everything in society today. Um, but again, we've given the resources online. I know that there are book listings, like movie and TV um, situations that you can go check out. There are websites. If you don't feel like reading, donate. Like there are so many ways to contribute to the, the movement. And I just think that, that people should leave, um, not leave Black Black, just people should not try to place more weight on Black people as we're just trying to stay afloat. And I agree with that. I think, you know, we put the efforts into a lot of other things. And this is like, we put the effort into it when it matters for right now, but keeping the conversation going, I think is going to be the utmost important thing as we continue to move forward with this thing as school starts to um, come back and all those other things. So kind of switching the narrative, you touched on it a little bit earlier, Ari, about HBCUs, something else that we've been seeing online a lot is it's about time HBCUs strive to get our student athletes back. Um, meaning more high profile and black student athletes as a whole need to consider HBCUs. So my take on this personally is I played division one college basketball. I was recruited only by one HBCU and you know what I mean? So there's two sides of a spectrum to this. HBCUs aren't necessarily recruiting or even going after the high profile players because they feel like she's out of my league like isis went to syracuse I, I don't think i have a chance of getting her and then another thing i feel as though people demean hbcus like off rip because they feel as though you're not as good as if, if you go there in the first place so kind of with that being said how do you feel about the idea of those statements and narratives like African-American players like need to go to HBCUs like it's kind of a sellout if you don't right now and I feel like a lot of these tweets are based off of emotion and due to what's happening um, but there is a bigger picture in all this thing like it is a business like HBCUs they go for the players just like any other school who they feel will fit in their system etc. Let, let me say this uh, people also have to remember that this is someone's life that's on the line right and, and so everybody can't be Colin Kaepernick and be the one to change that like everybody can't do that I, I can't tell you right now that if I was a, you know a rising senior getting ready to go that this in the world right now would make me consider an HBCU over going to Syracuse I, I honestly can't say that right because at the end of the day the person is choosing that path for them that there are a hundred different factors that could factor in besides Am I around people who look like me? Because let's be honest, most of these colleges aren't anyway. So I don't consider that. And none of my colleges, Florida, Syracuse, Fordham, definitely not Fordham or Florida. Was I around people that look like me every single day? So there are different factors such as education, location, uh, you know, what grad programs they have, different stuff like that. The basketball, the level that you're playing at or whatever sport, who's recruiting you kind of thing. And so I think there are too many factors to just say, everybody black, that's good, go to an HBCU. I, I, I just feel like um, that's a little too simple and you're shell selling people short of the dreams that they could have going to other places. You know, I, I, I just think it's that simple, but I also agree with you that HBCUs, I do not believe recruit if they don't think they can get these players. I have gotten, I mean, I was a top a hundred guard in the country from high school and got, you know, stuff from low D ones places. I would never even think to go right because they already knew, but they still sent the letter. They still reached out. I can't remember an HBCU that recruited me. Right. I can't, exactly. you right. know, so I, I think that's the honest truth. And, and I hate to be like that, but we've got to be honest in this conversation too. That I also 100%. think we need to do the work. Um, and, and then lastly, when we talk about the men's side, there is so much money involved in that. I mean, a player can go to Kentucky and be one and done and be in the league the next year and be making millions. So if you, if you feel like an HBCU may not give you what you need and give you the exposure to get to where you want to go at the end of the day you're making a business decision for your life as well you know mm -hmm. you you just can't choose it again because everybody black is there um and who's to say that things aren't always great at hbcus either 
if we yeah. if we really being honest, you know, who's to say yeah. that it's percent Black Lives Matter and everybody there is is doing what we say we're supposed to be doing? And I and that's no, no, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I tell people that all the time. Like, if I had to do it all over again, I would go to Sacred Heart. Like, I wouldn't choose another institution. I wouldn't choose UConn, any of that. But it's because of the opportunities that they specifically afforded me and the advantages that I was able to you know have going there getting two degrees in four years like not everybody can do that but I think if I went to a school like UConn the, the chances of that would have been very shy you know what I mean and it's not to say that I was recruited by them I wasn't that good y'all <laughs> I'm like, let me throw that out there no Gino didn't want me but <laughs> I'm just saying you know I like your perspective on that because it's a business on all sides me I'm choosing a business for myself and my career path and so are they but what were you going to say Ari I was just going to say I completely agree with you guys the blanketed statement and like of people saying you if you're black you need to go to HBCU I don't agree with that my mom went to HBCU she went to North Carolina Central University she got what she needed out of that my dad went to Duke he got what he needed out of that it's just a matter of what you see for yourself I think it's very um against what everybody's trying to fight for if you say that they have to because we should have the choice to do it um i i i think that in until especially on the women's side because we had shakila it's not her name shakila shakila who went to grambling state and averaged a quadruple double and still couldn't make it into the league when you have people that come off the bench for a higher d1 and and make a roster so it's just a matter of you know, it's systematic, right? The the people who are recruiting in, in the pro level have to value the MEACs, the CIAAs of the world. You know, they have to value those in order to even have that option to like pick a player from there. Um, I'm not really well versed in recruiting, but just, just the visibility, again, the facilities, it's just, there needs to be a change um, systematically before we can put that pressure onto younger players because they need to, there are some that have nothing and they, they just are on survival mode and need to make it out um, to provide for their family. So they're gonna do the choice that really um, makes sense for themselves and their family so that they can provide a better life for their mom, their auntie, their cousin, their grandma. Um, so again, I think I'm all about player choice. You can still go to PWI, make a statement, we're all products of PWIs making a statement, so we're a clear indication of that. But I do love the Gen Z that's coming up that's very unapologetic about everything that they do, and they're like, we're going to HBCUs. Good for you guys, because y'all are setting an example. It's going to take rounds and rounds and years and years and generations to, to build with what the whole point is. Um, but it, it's dope that HBCUs are being in consideration, and then now the attention's on them. Maybe the funding will get um, better. Maybe the exposure will get better. Maybe HBCUs will, like the, the staff will have the confidence to go after a, a bigger recruit. Um, it just starts, it's just systematic oppression over the years that um, they would need to overcome in order to make this really something that will be super beneficial for everybody. And I also wanna add to that and say, but we're also trying to make change. Right. Right. So if we go and everybody black runs to an HBCU, how much change we will create are we really creating? Mm -hmm. Right. We're still allowing those schools who have, you know, ACC, SEC, et cetera, do whatever they want to do, not have these conversations, not honor us, not stand mm -hmm. up for us. So really, I might even be more so of the opposite side of no, go to those schools where you think there's a representation and make a change. Because, mm -hmm. because if we run to the safe haven, like ain't nothing going to change. If everybody's just like, nah, man, we're just going to stay in the hood and chill and just stay in our own little peace, we will never be the level where we got as, as, a, as a community, you know? So I challenge people, like, go where they say you shouldn't and make a change and take some people with you and change that genre around. And then value, change your perspective of HBCUs just because right. you don't go there, just because, you know, just, just change that whole narrative that they're less than because that's not the case at all. 100%. Um, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. If I could do it all over again, I don't, I don't know if I would. Um, but you know, there are people that would and that will feel more at home. It's just a matter of what you prefer. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I called games at Howard University. So I kind of got that, you know, HBCU feel being there. And it's kind of like when I leave, I'm like, you know, that was nice to 
be around, to be around the campus, seeing all the black people and stuff like that. But then, you know, calling games for them, I do see like some of the things that they do lack and I wish were better and stuff like that. And I can only hope the best for the student athletes and how they continue to build. But, you know, watching their games, it's like, it's, it's like no other. They still put in the work, they do the same thing. So I don't feel as though people should bash or knock HBCUs, but I also shouldn't mm -hmm. feel like we put these um, high profile players on a pedestal like, hey, you know, you got to go here or whatever, all black people, let's rush to an HBCU. Uh, kind of just like you guys saying, I totally agree with the points that you guys are making. So kind of the last point that I want to touch on is how impactful our protests have been to make it not only here, but on a national scale. Like we have a video of Liz Cambage. She's going crazy in the streets in Australia, leading a protest and, you know, leading the charge. And it's showing that like, this is one of the times where I felt like, dang, like maybe a change will really come because of the impact that George Floyd's death has had. And, you know, the many others that we don't even hear of but uh just talk about like the impact that it's had on you to see like how how wide scale this thing really has gone as far as the protest and uh you know all the posts and like i said something that was impactful for me to see was liz cambage's video well australia has always had a racism problem they have always had i mean it's probably worse than here to be honest um so i'm glad liz who is an iconic figure especially in australia uh, is speaking out against it but then you have one of my best friends, Amanda Zawi B. She's in Sweden marching. Um, but it is a global impact because, again, this is a human rights issue. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad to see everybody, you know, internationally come in solidarity um, for a greater good. And it, it, it means that it's so bad that the whole world has to jump in. So maybe that can contribute to, like, the importance of it mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, state for state being like hey this is a problem you got you got the germans worried you know like that's like come on bro <laughs> come on no um i agree i think it's been great to see it's been really moving um it makes me feel like i'm in a history book like i know everyone keeps saying that our children will look back on 2020 and be like dang mommy made it through that yes i did and i protested i, I had to sneak out the house the other day to protest because my mom is like, oh, you know, Corona, I don't want you going, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, this is my time. Like, if I don't, who will? You know, kind of thing. And so um, I think it's just, it makes me feel like I am part of history. It makes me feel like what my friends are doing, my brothers and sisters that are next to me that I've known forever, walking next to me, are part of history. Um, and I feel you on the, the hope for change. I'm, I'm not going to lie, you know, the first two days uh, after George Floyd's death, I didn't have hope. You know, I was really like in my room, like, I just may not come out until I got to be on the court because otherwise, I, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Am I, am I going to make it to the court? First of all, if we really being honest, am I going to make it to the court in, in this, in this status or, you know, whatever that we're in. Um, but I moved to see that people are being resilient. We are resilient people. I tell everyone that we're built to overcome, right? We undid 400 years of something. We just going to keep on doing it for 400 more. Um, and so I, I think it's amazing to see and our athletes have to step up. They have the voice. They can't just shut up and dribble. Um, and we prove that time and time again that we're so important. So I love it. I love it. I love where we are right now as a people, as athletes. And I think we're just going to keep going forward and we have to. Well, I love the conversation that we were able to have. I think it was amazing to be able to shed this light, especially from two athletes and then a journalist who covers athletes as a whole and you know i was an athlete too i was just a cheerleader you were, you're a cheerleader you're an athlete for show uh, athlete you were in show. athletics yes <laughs> you're at, you're more athletic than me especially from your picture i like, already got most flexibility yeah out here, <laughs> no i can't do none of that but yeah. <laughs> I, I do thank you both for the time. I thank you so much for this conversation. And that will do it for another episode of Life After with Tykera Carter. <laughs>